This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. Today on the podcast, we're going to be talking to Zaid, who is a health coach obsessed with holistic healing for his clients. He is a fan of the 80-20 rule, but not in the way you may have learned about it. We're going to be talking about all these things, including things like cellular water production, sunlight, and the nuances, all of which in between. Learning that diet is really not as important as you think, or at least not the most important. Let's dive in. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today, we have another great conversation lined up. We have Zaid here from California, health coach. How's it going, Zaid? I'm doing amazing. It's a, it's a beautiful morning and uh, excited to hop on this conversation right now. Awesome. So we're definitely going to dive into a lot of health things, Zaid's story, and uh, see what we dive into rabbit hole wise, but also joined as well by my co-host, Ryan. As always, Ryan, how's it going? Great. Just sitting in the dark, desolate basement surrounded by toxic blue light and my toxic sauna light in the background, just living the dream. <laughs> Got to get a little grounding in later to try and negate some of this horrible, horrible lifestyle that I have going on <laughs> right now. Yeah. Well, that's what we were talking about before we, we got recording here is I'm if you're not watching the video, I'm kind of in my garage outside, and I know Zaid as well is, is big on circadian biology, so maybe we talk a little bit more about that. But first, you know, everyone has a health journey. Ryan and I have shared ours on this podcast, and I'm curious, Zaid, you know, how did you, because you're, you're pretty clear on Twitter how, you know, impactful you can be when you just become obsessive about a topic, and I'm really curious and excited to hear about how did you reach this point of becoming so obsessive about health optimization? Was this your story of healing or, you know, family members walk us through kind of how you got where you are today in terms of wanting to uh, learn everything and everything about health? Yeah, great question. I think um, I, I am a firm believer that anybody who really pursues the holistic health path is is pushed to is pushed into that corner because either they're struggling through something um, whether it be like a chronic condition or something else, or they have a family member who's struggling through it or has passed from it. So in my case, I had a father who passed from heart disease. Um, he suffered his second heart attack in about, I believe, a year time span. And it really, it was the first heart attack that got me thinking about health in general. That's, that's what r- really planted the seed for me. Um, and of course, you know, I've been in the athletic, uh, the athletic uh, competition realm. I've played competitive soccer. I'm sure you have too, Tristan, if, if I believe correct. Um, and, and that's always been there. But after that second heart attack, like for some reason, it really just like kicked me in the ass. And it forced me to make a vow to myself that I really want to be obsessive about this path. And I wasn't going to l- allow anything to stop me because this is really the work that I feel like I'm born to do. Um, And now over time, as the years have passed and I've developed expertise, I've worked with clients that has that sort of feeling of passion has really hit me and and unexpectedly, too. So that's that's really just a bit of my background. It comes from a really painful experience, but I've transcended that and I've used that to help other people. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be like most people's stories that at least are falling into the space or get into health coaching in, in, in some capacity. I know that's my story. I mean, that's similarly Tristan's story. And I find like we spoke to people like Brian Sanders, who really got into health as well, based on his parents passing away too early. um, And from systemic illness that now we sort of know can be avoided by a lot of the simple health strategies that that you are implementing such things as circadian biology, as we kind of mentioned earlier, um, eating right, moving right, um, and really paying attention to our body and our body's needs. And so it's a really fascinating, uh, it's a really fascinating thing to to see what brings people into this sort of community. And also it's sort of saddening to feel that it has to be that way almost to really get into it. I wish it was instilled in us as children. Sometimes it is, it's very, it's very uh, rare, I would say. It's something that we can work on in future generations as 
we uh, we draw our families and stuff like that. But tell me a little bit more about sort of your health coaching experiences, things that you maybe didn't see, um, you know, b- uh, bottlenecks and things that you noticed on that path. Because I think a lot of people have this aspiration in the, in the community that get into the health to maybe become a health coach after their experience of, of dramatic healing. Um, but I think there's a lot of nuances to that because it's not giving a cookie cutter approach to everybody that we see in conventional medicine and even functional medicine. I see it where you get prescribed instead of medication, just hundreds of supplements and then are put on your way after spending thousands of dollars on functional testing. So I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of your philosophy in coaching and health. And also sort of, uh, I'd love to hear about your sort of, uh, I'll call it your side gig, but I guess it's sort of your main gig of working. You were, we were talking about, you work with DEXA scans and all that stuff and how that can be useful for somebody that's trying to increase their, their optimal health. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, obsession really is my MO. I think, um, and I've referred to that word so many times because I just want to hammer it into people's heads. Like this is, if you get into the health coaching realm and you, and you manage to acquire clients and you start working with them in my mind, that is an immense responsibility. Uh, To me, it's even more responsibility than someone who were to, who were to come into a hospital. You have hundreds of nurses, hundreds of doctors, and you're almost like passed around in that hospital hospital. You're almost seen as like a, you know, just a, a serial number in my opinion. And of course, that's not the case in all hospitals. A lot of doctors have good intentions, but if you really want to pursue the holistic health coaching path, like that's that's going to be an immense responsibility, and you have to make sure that you dial in your your uh, your system. You know how to socialize with people. You know how to meet people w- where they're at, um, and most importantly, you focus on timeless, effective principles. Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Results are the only thing that people really care about. They don't care about your qualifications. They don't care about your MD, the plaque on the wall. Um, they really want to see that you've helped people in their position. And as a result, you have um, you can get them results. So that's a little bit about the health coaching. I think um, what's very interesting to me is that working with people who come in for DEXA scans and RMR, which is resting metabolic rate, and then VO2 max testing, is that you get to see all the different perspectives through which people think about health. You you get to see the carnivores coming in, the vegans, um, people who rank 50% body fat on their DEXA scans. Like you really get to see the entire spectrum of uh, like a typical population. And as a result, that informs your health coaching. It's definitely informed my health coaching because it's just wild to me how some people think. Um, And and really it's just, uh, it's enlightening to say the least. Yeah, so I guess... That, I mean, it all makes sense, right? And and we talk about like how the average individual is wronged by the centralized, you know, healthcare system, medical system, often because, like you said, they're they're treated as a serial number, and you know, you get five, ten minutes with your doctor, and and that's kind of it. So the more decentralized approach to this is, you know, connecting with individuals like yourself who can really take the time to dive deep and like you're saying, become obsessive. Would you say that's kind of like the biggest difference you see with like what you're offering and what in general, like decentralized health should look like? And, you know, how do you envision that kind of, you know, growing and and how do we continue to expand this movement um, towards a more decentralized fashion away from kind of the traditional healthcare system? Yeah, great question. I, I think a lot of it has to do with, you, you have to take a holistic framework. That is really what I value in my work. Um, because I see it like even in the medical community, and, and since I'm around, you know, different doctors and, and we work with all that different form of uh, different forms of testing, I see how even these doctors who have spent two, five, 10 years in school, they, they really don't focus on the most important things. They talk about macros. If they're a nutritionist, they talk about the testing, they talk about losing body fat or, or something of that nature, but they're not focused on sleep. I, I never hear the words circadian biology coming from their mouth. Um, I never hear about just chronic stress in general or nutrient density or, or, the, or the difference between plant and animal protein and, and the bioavailability availability with that. So I really think from the conventional perspective, it's just not good enough. Like these people at the end of the day aren't obsessed with the work. And so they're not going to dive into the nitty gritty details that make all the difference. 
And do you think that's also a result of their training, like of their education? Because the way I see it is, you know, I'm also coming from, I'm, I'm an engineer. Like I have a master's degree in electrical engineering. Couldn't be further from like the traditional healthcare or nutrition or medical training that you would get in undergrad, like biology. Last time I took biology was freshman year of high school, but it almost offers this unbiased perspective when you come into it. Like you don't have to go through this unlearning period if you come out with, or you're coming from, uh, you know, a background in schooling that's, that's different. But for me, it's, you know, actually exciting as well, because there, there is this connectiveness between a lot of fields and, and actually my background is becoming more prevalent than I ever imagined because, you know, physics and um, just in general, kind of like circadian non-native EMFs actually do apply to health quite a bit. But I'm curious if you have that same thought because I, I'm also big on, you know, the qualifications, certifications, you know, it's it's semantics, really. It's good to show that you've gone through this discipline. And yeah, if, if you're a health coach and things like that, it's important to have a framework and understanding of basic biological functions. But to me, it's almost it's 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 two two areas that are interesting because it's like you could use that knowledge you had from school to go and improve that and become more holistic and and unlearn or you can have this clean slate and really dive into what matters right away yeah i agree 100 percent. here's the tricky thing too is like indoctrination is very sneaky so you you mentioned a key word unlearn how do you know how do you develop the awareness to know that you should unlearn if you really think that you have the truth because you've been indoctrinated by a whole bunch of other information and, and you've spent your life within a system. Like that, that's the tricky thing is just stepping away from it. And that's also what I appreciate about health Twitter, because it's a unique community that shows all these different holistic perspectives. It's not perfect, but it's, it's light years ahead of the conventional system in my mind. And I would like to even like on top of that, speaking of like indoctrination, like that idea of having to break free of, a system or a thought process or ideology that you've sort of been sort of hammered into. I mean, I always go back to my experience with being in the LDS Mormon church for nine months, even though it's not the same thing as health, it's sort of the same thing from an observational standpoint. So quick divergent story. I was Mormon for nine months in tail end of my high school year. I was senior in high school. I was dating a Mormon girl, kind of like first young love situation. And I got really into the church because I wanted to be with her, all that kind of stuff. And I never really believed any of the stuff, but it was interesting going to meetings, going to all the different uh, things you have to go through. Like you have sacrament, then Sunday school, then like a thing called young men's, which is like just for men. And then they split the women off and do a thing called young women's. And you sort of get to see what I think happens in almost every facet of conventional society, whether that be in medicine or in religion or in anything, we sort of have these thought processes. I mean, it happens in school all the time. I mean, you go to school, conventional, you know, K through 12, you learn all these things that you think are important. You take your ACT and you go to college to get your degree, to work in a box till you retire and then start your life. So it's really interesting to see how these sort of same, I think, thought processes happen in different facets of all of our society. And to me, the unlearning part and the relearning part all goes back to having an open mind and being open to ideas that are not of your own or that were not instilled to you. I mean, it's the same with politics and all that stuff. But I think the most difficult part is getting someone to have that open mind. And the difference, I believe, for myself, you and probably Tristan, Zaid, is that we had these sort of traumatic experiences that almost forced us to think outside of the box. Like for me, I went through, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called small fiber neuropathy in 2019, went through the conventional system, saw the best doctors in the country for six months, just on this journey, just hitting just wall after wall and just being denied and being made to feel crazy. And that's when I had to open my mind was like, I finally hit the wall. It was like, wow, I actually do have to think outside the box because I just realized how broken our system is. But if you don't have a problem like that, it's really hard to open your mind because you almost have a no reason to. And I think that's changing over the last couple of years with all the things that are going on in society. But I'd sort of love your thoughts on like how we crack that walnut of people's minds and open them 
to alternative ways of thinking, thinking for themselves, really. Mm. Yeah, it's a very tough nut to crack. I think um, education has to be the foundation. Education has to be the the key through which we guide people through this process. Um, it, at least from my experience, that's been the only th- outside of outside of traumatic experience. That's been the only real effective thing that's lasted. Because if you at the end of the day, you don't know what you don't know. So once you start learning about these various areas, whether it's circadian biology or or sleep or nutrition or hydration, then your mind starts to enter a different realm. And then you're forced to make new connections through that. And as a result, you start playing around with these different lifestyle changes. And before you know it, because these are such timeless principles, you start to feel better through that. And as a result, you don't have to be convinced to, to continue down that path. Um, so it's almost like if you can get people in the door and and they do have an open enough mind to start experimenting with these things, then the momentum carries itself and, and really hopefully guides them to um, the kind of lifestyle that we all aspire to here. Are you interested in 100% grass-fed, grass-finished bison meat? I'm excited to be a partner with Falls Family Ranches. Based in Wyoming, Falls Family Ranches is raising high-quality bison meat the way nature intended. As a native large ruminant of North America, bison is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can consume. If you're interested in trying out their bison boxes, use code TRISTAN, T-R-I-S-T-A-N, 10, for 10% off your first order. Yeah, I think it's like we talked about before on this podcast. It's like it's almost important to just show them like one actionable thing that they can do because it's like there's so much also misinformation out there, which is, you know, the problem. And I I think, you know, in general, especially for for males, right, you get the whole like fitness bodybuilding community is like for the longest time that was that was the picture of of health. Right. And now it's like, okay, like, you know, we need to explain how that's not, you know, really health, um, what it should look like. That's a specific, you know, goal people are orientated towards, which is like aesthetics. And there is a lot of overlap, of course. And people that do both but i think it's kind of opening people's eyes to oh you can actually feel a lot better you know the the biggest issue i see is that people are just so programmed in their daily lives lifestyles and routines and you know they live in cities they never go outside they're never connected with the earth they're barely moving they're drinking all the time they're drinking you know alcohol they're smoking weed they're they're drinking coffee every morning they don't even really know how they actually feel if they were just to do nothing you know if they were just to raw dog it for 3 days then they would get an idea probably of how shitty they actually feel. And then you take that person in that situation and, you know, throw them uh, outside and eating better quality food. And it's like, wow, you could actually make a big difference. But that's the biggest issue for me, as I see, is people just don't comprehend how much better they could actually feel until there's a breaking point and then they have to, you know, come and seek help. So that's why I think you're saying, you know, education is important and also just showing people kind of like an insight into, you know, our lives and what we do and sharing our story because it's like, hey, you know, you don't have to get to this breaking point like us. Um, you can be proactive. And that all comes down to the mindset of just being more, you know, um, empowered at the individual level is, is the mindset, you know, start thinking low time preference, not high time preference and, and being proactive instead of reactive. But I think that's the greater, you know, issue with, with our society, to be honest. And yeah, it's all work in progress. <laughs> that, that's music to my ears, man. And I think um, also one important point when it comes to dealing with quote unquote normies, like at the end of the yeah. day, you have to approach these these individuals with, with compassion. You have to understand that you were once in that position. So why are you trying to demonize their, where they are um, or demonize that type of mentality? You have to understand that they are stuck in a maze and they need to get out of that maze through ideally your help if you know what you're doing. Um, and so when you come across somebody who says that cholesterol causes heart disease or eggs are terrible for you or cows destroy the planet, you have to lean into that conversation and, de- and develop the reps to persuade somebody uh, otherwise. You have to. You can't step away from that and then 
label people as idiots. It, it's not how life works. You, you really have to get into the arena and then make sure that you're always working on your persuasion skills in order for you to push this holistic agenda for health. Yeah, I think it's really it's really important because it's so easy today to just get caught up in these, you know, diet wars and just this controversial content because that's what sells, right? And, you know, we find ourselves doing it no matter what. But I, I thought about that a lot when I was like writing my book and talking about, yeah, like our cow is bad for the environment and, you know, what to say about vegans. And if you read my book, you see that I'm actually pretty nice uh, and neutral talking about vegans because like in general, it's like, hey, they're they're actually making an actionable step to improve their diet and their health. This is already like a good, a great first step. They just have the wrong information or have been misled by, you know, outside sources that are funded by, you know, parties of interest. And this is the problem um, that people, they just become so dogmatic and then they just shut that down. When if you approach it with, you know, some compassion and say, hey, you know, it's great you want to make, you know, an, an impact on your health or the health of the environment. But let me try and convince you why I think, you know, it's actually untrue and you should be doing X, Y, or Z. And yeah, I, it's, it's just so easy to get caught up in, in these diet wars and in general, the dogma of my team versus, versus your team. So I'm curious in general, it seems like you're pretty, you know, you're not in one camp for diet. You're, you're looking at the whole picture. Um, are you pretty, you know, individualistic in, in what you prescribe uh, and what you do personally in terms of diet, you know, exercise routine and lifestyle environmental factors? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all about personalization in my mind because you have to start with where the person is at um, in regards to like training, sleep, nutrition, hydration, all of these things. And it's very important to understand that like just speaking from the nutrition context, Biochemical individuality is king in my mind. Everyone is different. Everyone comes from a different genetic background. Uh, we are exposed to different toxins. We live different lifestyles. We have different stress thresholds. So as a result, you need to work around the individual as opposed to just throwing a cookie cutter nutrition plan at them. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be nice to say that everyone, every single person on the planet would do amazing on an animal-based diet, like strict animal-based I think there are a lot of good foundational principles in that diet, but it's not going to work for everybody. And, and to say that it is, is really that that's ideological, that's dogma. So that's why I don't really have, like, I don't want to take any camps here. If, if you want to follow more of a vegetarian lifestyle, okay, we have to make sure that we have, um, you know, enough protein and all these other things so that we, we supplement that diet according to what you want and where your mind is at. And then slowly over time, you know, if you want to educate so educate someone on the importance of eating meat, then you can progressively do that and then they'll notice benefits and then there you go. But the, the biochemical individuality is, is very key for me. Um, and then metabolic typing as well. Those two are really foundational for my nutrition approach. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the camp. I mean, if there's a camp, it's sort of the individual. I mean, that's that goes back too to working with with clients is like if you approach every client with the same ideological idea about them without meeting them where they're at. I think that was actually one of the most important statements you made for this whole podcast is, is a good, a real, a great coach will meet people where they are at and meet them where their needs are, where they and where they struggle the most. And it's a lot about listening. Um, and it, like you said, you have to almost be obsessed to, I think, do a good job. And like, I liked how you sort of put that, um, job on a pedestal in a sense, because it's like, it's in your hands. Like they're trusting you. Hopefully they're being fully vulnerable and fully like fully willing. And there's a whole nuance in there, but it's, it's super individual. And it took me a long time to even realize that for myself because I wanted certain things to work that were working for, at least it felt like to me, everybody else, whether that was like keto for a long time or whatever, like carnivore, like animal based, like, and I've learned that there's so many nuances that go beyond diet. And maybe we can kind of dive into that right now yeah. because I think everyone, I, I get, I'm sure, I'm sure you get messages like this Tuesday all the time. I know Tristan and I do about, Hey, if I do this, will I get this result? And the truth is I can't tell you the answer because there's so many things I do not know about you and it's not X, Y, and Z. And I always use myself as an example from 
my autoimmune stuff with small fiber and stuff like that is like what worked for me with reducing my symptoms and all that honestly probably isn't going to be the same for you we have co- had completely different life paths like i guarantee you probably didn't have an eating disorder per se when you were 18 and just wrecked your body like i did it's not everybody so i'd sort of love to hear the nuances beyond diet we can kind of get into some circadian biology stuff and the importance of that too i know we've talked about it a lot on the podcast but there's so much more than just what you put in your body there's what you put on your body what you're exposed to throughout the day what you see through your eyes what do you think on your tier list are things that are the most important things outside of the food which is individual to an extent what yes. do you think are are sort of key cornerstones of health great question number 1 and this is this is by far the most important in my mind is sleep um i really do think that's the keystone pillar of health and a lot of people neglect that i come across a lot of people who have sleep issues whether it's insomnia waking up five times throughout the night to take a piss um you know waking up feeling like they just got hit by a truck that's a huge problem for people and of course that is rooted in circadian biology so the the phrase that i like to relate to people who aren't aware of circadian biology is is really simple brighter days darker nights you maximize natural sunlight in the day and you minimize artificial blue light during the night and uh and you make use of like candles and firelight and uh incandescent bulbs all of these other things so that in my mind sleep is like number 1 but another thing that i've really been exploring in depth is this idea that detoxification today is more important than nutrition So a lot of people focus on what kind of food they're eating and that that's that counts for a lot but are we thinking about detoxifying our body in a holistic way are we thinking about using activated charcoal to clear up all the bullshit that we're exposed to on a daily basis because if you can't flush out all of that stuff and you're holding on to toxicity then you're not going to get as much out of your nutrition you're not going to get as much out of your your other lifestyle fundamentals so In my mind those are two things that that are really important. Um what else? I mean probably supplementation is thing is one that people are really lost on from my experience. And again, that's just personalization. Like it, it all depends on the individual. Yeah, I want to maybe we we'll talk a little bit more about supplementation, but first, you know, the sleep thing, obviously. I th- I think we agree, you know, a ton as well on that. It's like, you know, circadian biology, sleep, it's all yeah, like you're saying, it's all connected. Actually, it's all if you could name six pillars of health or whatever you want and they're all connected that's yeah. the brilliance of it but sometimes people like to just focus on on one thing and i think diet has become that because it's like the most you know fundamentally um can, like you can grasp that concept and and of course exercising which is pretty pretty easy to do and it's all rooted in this calories in calorie out like equation of which I despise by the way. Yeah, yeah, which I think we all disagree with and I think that's why it's been so honed in on on diet and exercise. It's like if you eat less and move more, you'll be healthier, which, you know, for the average person sure that might be true, but there's so much more going on and that's why it's important to consider things like your light environment and your sleep uh quality. So, uh, you know, just a uh, an easy question is like, you know, what you mentioned some some hacks as well but what's kind of the the ultimate way to get the best night of sleep you think for like the average person great question um so again so the the brighter days darker nights that rule of thumb really does do a lot of the heavy lifting but some other things in my mind are um making sure to avoid food uh 2 to 3 hours before bed so i like to finish my last meal at at 7:30 i can get away with uh eating at like 8 8:30 if it's something light and nutrient dense but avoiding food later into the evening is massive for people i've seen i've seen incredible shifts in energy and digestion and all these different things from that and then another one is just um making sure that we become aware of our stimulant use or our uh depressant use so uh alcohol for example huge problem people consume that late into the evening all the time Usually I recommend like if you're going to have alcohol last drink at 4 p.m. just to make sure that um you know it it doesn't impact your sleep. And then the two bigger ones are caffeine and nicotine. Um caffeine more so just because that has a longer half-life. 
But if we can teach people how to know whether they're a slow or, or fast genetic caffeine metabolizer, and then we can schedule it like, look, 12 p.m. noon is going to be your last cup of coffee. And then we'll see how that impacts your sleep. That's big. Uh, the same with nicotine, but I think those are some really important principles. Um, but again, the light environment really does make a huge difference. And then lastly is like sleep timing. For me, sleep timing is massive. So, you know, 9 to 10 p.m. sweet spot is really what I aim for and what I tell people to, to go for. So just quickly, that metabolic, so you're talking about metabolic type earlier, and that's kind of like what you work with in your other uh, job a bit more. Is that what you mean when you're talking about how things are metabolized in the body and how that differentiates uh, per, or that's different person to person? Um, and what does that all encompass? Because it sounds pretty interesting to be able to dial that in. Yeah, metabolic typing essentially refers to, um, and there was a book on it, I forgot who the author was, but it just refers to the idea that your ancestors grew up in a specific region of the world. They had access to different types of food and whatever they consistently consumed for generations funnels down into what you would most likely thrive on. So for example, like the metabolic typing framework, and this just relates to nutrition, but it breaks down into three different types. So you have a polar type, uh, a variable type, and then an equatorial type. For me as a polar type, I do well on animal-based like animal-based fatty cuts of meat, uh, darker cuts of meat, that is really what I thrive on. And if I consume any refined carbohydrate, it just destroys me. But if you are an equatorial type, then you actually do well on a higher carb approach. So of course, assuming that it's nutrient-dense food and prepared properly, you could go as high as 70% carbs and still thrive from what I've seen. So, And then the variable is just a mix of both. Um, so it, it really just relates to nutrition specifically, but it's it's a very interesting er, study. That's that's what I was wondering. I was just wondering if you were going based because you were talking about. I, I have the same sort of idea in my head, but I was curious your thoughts on it a little bit deeper. Is like, are you kind of basing that on like haplotype, like me and Tristan, kind of like Northern European ancestry? I mean, Tristan's mother's from Austria, right? So you're like yeah. almost directly there. My grandmother's from Northern UK. And that's just referring to, for those who don't know what haplotype is, it's just mitochondrial genetics. Yeah, I, I think haplotype is, uh, I don't use it specifically to that degree. I think that would be valuable for people who want to go more in depth um, because it, it, it is going to take a lot of research to see, okay, what did this specific group of people eat for generations? What did this group, group of people eat for generations? I, I approach it more from the, the perspective of like, look, there are certain questions that indicate and I have a questionnaire for this. There are certain questions that indicate what you fall into um, in terms of those three buckets. And I, ha I have yet to see it fail. I've genuinely yet to see it fail. I've had people who I've worked with say like, look, this makes a lot of sense. And my genetic heritage has eaten exactly this way. And I happen to thrive on it. But this is the first time that I'm trying this. Yeah, it just makes me think of my grandfather because my grandfather's... Um... I mean, both my families are, are from Europe and like pretty recent, like immigrated here within the last hundred years. And uh, it's interesting. My grandpa always talks about Lutfisk constantly because his father's Norwegian came over on a whaling ship in the early 1900s. Wow. And uh, I we used to, we, he used to always give us, he'd always make Lutfisk at Christmas, which is basically just like a, it's sort of a white fish dish, but it has a really unique, I'm going to use the word stank to it. Uh, it, it, so it's interesting talking about this stuff because it's things that actually, when you, uh, kind of from a 30,000 foot view make complete sense. Like you said, like your clients say like, Oh, this makes complete sense. And I think it's just a logical way to approach it. It is really logical. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because it's, you know, what, what you're saying is that, you know, people should just be eating, you know, more similar to the diet and the environment that they're in, right? Like if you're from the equatorial, you know, background, you know, there's going to be more produce, there's going to be more fruit, there's going to be more light. So getting back to circadian biology, and that's all interconnected in health. Whereas, you know, you're saying you're from, you know, northern, more northern latitudes and, and this polar metabolic type where there's not a lot of produce available and, and they had to adapt and, what they did was they consumed a lot more fat. They consumed a lot more like DHA. They had less light. Um, they got cold. So cold plays into that. It's, it's really fascinating. But at the end of the day, 
it's pretty simple. It's logical, right? It's like you should be eating in the environment that you were made um, and biologically, you know, adapted for. But the problem is, you know, people live all over the world now and their backgrounds are from wherever. So you kind of have to map that out for them. So that's why it's nice to, you know, have someone like you look into this. And is that a test? Like that's an easy test to do? Or how do you, I guess, like find that out? Oh, well, I mean, just get um, the book, Metabolic Typing by William Walcott. I believe that's the author's name. Okay, cool. And in, in that, I, I think he has a questionnaire that, that runs you through it. Um, and I pretty much use that questionnaire, but I've also added a few things to it to, to make sure that it's it's more comprehensive in my mind. Yeah. But again, like, last thing on this is like, there are people who will tell you that genetics don't matter. They absolutely do matter. Even though epigenetics in my mind is more important, but as you become older, like for example, centenarians, in order to be a centenarian in the first place, that's where genetic SNPs and genes really pay, play a big part. Um, there, there are probably four or five genetic polymorphisms that are involved in having people live up to the age of 100 plus. So that, that just goes to show the importance of genetics. And you'll often see that these people smoke, they drink, they, they drink Diet Coke, they eat like crap sometimes. And it, it goes to display that genetics really does play a huge role in this conversation. Yeah. I mean, one thing I've noticed with people like that too, that, that tend to be centenarians, if you're looking at places in Italy or, or like, uh, like Okinawa or something like that, there seems to be like also a sense of community as well with like these people, like they're very connected with their community. They have strong family bonds. And these are things that I think personally lack in a, in our sort of connected online world that we live in now. And so I've really made that. It, it sounds it almost, I won't say it sounds dumb, but when, when you work with someone and you mention these things to people, it's, it's almost so simple that I feel like it's hard for, it was hard for me, hard for the average person to like wrap your mind around how simple it really is. When you think about it, it's like get morning sun, eat real food, um, talk to people in real life. Yeah. Wisdom and, wisdom is never complex. It's always simple. It's always poignant and it hits you hard. Yes. And I feel like people want complicated um, for some reason. I feel like we're drawn to complicated. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just a fascinating psychology point. And, I, and it, this actually ties into the point I want to make now about supplementation because there's so much talk about supplementation forever. Um, forever. People have been talking about supplements, like what's the best type of magnesium to take, when to take it. What do you see are the biggest problems? And I'll just put in my two cents really quickly about supplements here is I think, like you said, there's so much confusion. It's so individual and it's very easy to mess up and you can be taking 20 things and they're not, not one of them are doing anything for you beneficially um, because you simply don't have other things in order and all of those things. So I'd love your thoughts on like, what do you see as the biggest issues with people trying to do self-supplementation or just supplementation in general? Kind of what's your philosophy? Because I, I know it's very individual. So it's step number one, and it makes me chuckle because I've seen this a lot. I'd probably say like 50% of my clients, and of course, it's already a self-selection bias. So 50% of my clients have at least 15 supplements in their supplement stack. And I've been at that point where I have that many supplements in my stack, but Again, like I'm testing things out. It's not for the purpose of like, I'm doing this for six plus months. So that's a big problem is just buying too many supplements without the understanding of what you're getting into and without the understanding of what condition or symptom you're trying to get rid of or treat. So th that's foundational right there. In my opinion, quality over quantity is going to be more important than just hammering, you know, 25 plus supplements on Amazon and just buying it, you know? That, that's one thing. Um, another thing in my mind is like a lot of people don't do the research to understand what forms of vitamins that they're buying. Um, so like a great example is zinc oxide. If, you, if you're getting zinc oxide, like it's not, I believe it's not as bioavailable as like a zinc monomethionine or uh, zinc gluconate, something like that. So in order to, to get the effectiveness out of these compounds, you have to buy them in the right form. And not only do you have to buy them in the right form, you have to buy them with the right things that create the synergistic effect within your body. So zinc must always be paired with copper. That is a non-negotiable. Um, because if you take too much zinc, then you're just going to create a copper deficiency and that's going to lead to more problems. 
And then other things, I mean, you see there's a lot of like BS supplement companies out there. I'm a huge fan of a, a company called Symbiotica. I, I don't know if you guys have heard of them. I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but I've tested each one of their products. And really, like we're talking about everything from the, the founder to the understanding that he has about holistic health to the understanding of how to package these things in a liposomal form to just the general brand awareness of how to get this health information out to normal people. So I know that was long winded, but those are just a few things that come to mind about supplementation. No, I think they're all, it's all the truth, right? I mean, in general, it's like sketchy. It's like a sketchy water that you're navigating through. And, and especially when you first get into this space, you're like, you know, everyone wants to sell you everything under the sun and everything's the magic pill and everyone's deficient and everything. Um, so for me, yeah, I've, I mean, compared to four years ago, I take like 95% less supplements. I mean, I take very few nowadays, if at all. Um, and maybe they're more like herbal or, you know, natural and, and they're just for, you know, they're tools, right? You know, a lot of these things, it comes down to their tools. And like you're saying, they're not for six months. It might be for a week, two weeks, 30 days. It depends what's going on. If you're traveling, for example, I just got back from, from Europe and I'm, I'm supplementing more on during that trip because it's, you know, an unnatural and un- unhealthy environment to be in. That's just an example, right? Um, but the forums, yeah, as well, I think that's like step one. But in in general, you know, how, how should people know or like how do you navigate exactly, you know, deficiencies? Um, are you testing them? Are you kind of just seeing what they get from their food? So in general, we all believe probably – uh, here that, you know, it's always best to get these things, your nutrients um, from food because they're naturally packaged in a synergistic formula in ways that we can't even comprehend. And we just had Stefan von Fleet, who does all this research, talk about that and he's saying we barely even know how the downstream metabolites of food work. But are you kind of looking at their diet? Are you looking at blood tests to see what they're deficient in and, and then going from there? Great uh, point there. I think I definitely look at diet. I like to see how nutrient dense their their nutrition is overall. That's one area that I look at. Um, blood testing, I don't really focus on blood testing for the purpose of seeing whether they have vitamin or mineral deficiencies. I, I feel like most people are pretty good in that department. Um, I like to look at symptoms. So I, I really do believe that our body expresses itself through the language of symptoms. So if you feel great, if you uh, have great oral health, if you uh, have great sleep, you're able to perform in the gym, that's an indicator. That's your body telling you through its own language that you're doing great. But if you're experiencing headaches, brain fog, rashes, um, insomnia, these things are indicators that your body is really screaming for help. Um, but in the beginning, it only comes out, it, it only comes out as a whisper. So it's something faint. You can't really hear it that well but you notice it. And then over time, if you neglect that, then it eventually it becomes a scream. And that's where you have serious chronic issues uh, down, the, down the road into the future. But what else do I look, look at? I, I think mainly, I, I like to look at it from the perspective of biodynamic farming as well. Like our soil health is extremely damaged. So um, magnesium is one that I generally recommend to most people just because of that. And then uh, from there, I really do like to take more of a, a detoxification approach. So activated charcoal is also another thing that I really think most people would benefit from. How do you, um, I'm just curious, because I think, I don't know if, I bet most people probably would take it wrong initially, but like how, how do you, how does one take activated char- charcoal so that you're not also binding to, because I've always been told to take it like in between meals or like so many hours after eating or whatever, so that you don't end up binding things that you just are taken in, you know what I mean? Yeah. uh, Amazing question. It's something I've been thinking about because I I do stay more on the cautious side where I've heard things like, okay, activated charcoal does have the potential to bind to certain vitamins and minerals. So I usually take it on an empty stomach, either in the morning or right before bed. But I was reading, I was just listening to a few like podcast episodes on um, David Avocado Wolf. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. Yeah. Um, Like a really, really solid... um, I guess, nutrition guy over the past three decades or so. And he talks about the amazing benefits of activated charcoal and, and that it actually has this electromagnetic 
the the way it operates is more electromagnetic than just like it's just a sponge that soaks everything up. So it has a negative charge, and, and we use activated charcoal to actually enhance the health of the soil for the benefit of plants and, and fruit. Um, but if it does act that way, then I believe it, it actually has more intelligence than we give it credit for. And I don't think science has discovered this yet, but it could just pick out the bad things uh, through an electromagnetic process and then leave the good things. But I'm not sure on that end. That's something that I've yet to discover. But just to be safe, I take it on an empty stomach. Yeah, no, that's kind of my philosophy too, at least how I've how I've been doing it, especially when you're in an environment. I think some people are in an environment that they can't completely control, um, whether that's like a work environment or home environment. And that's when I think activated charcoal is even more important because you're actively being exposed to things like you need to be doing absolutely everything you can do to mitigate those things. And that's definitely part of it. I actually have one question on activated charcoal, not to like come at you or anything and make sure. it seem like I'm I'm trying to like give you an impossible question, but it's a question that I've thought of um, with potential clients as well coming to me or you, I'm sure you've had them come to you where they're on, they have some sort of systemic chronic illness or on multiple medications throughout the day. And you know that charcoal would be beneficial for them, but they're afraid to take it because they don't want it to interact with a medication during the day. How do you approach that sort of thing with detox? I mean, there are lots of ways to do detox, but specifically that way, would you even recommend our activated charcoal or probably not? I'm just kind of curious because I know that's been a thing that's come up to me. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't recommend it straight off the bat. Um, like, for example, if I've never worked with somebody who's obese, but if I were to, if I were to onboard somebody who is in that position, like I'm not going to recommend a seven day fast straight out the gate. I, I just think it's not wise. Um, we have to really get other things in order. So in terms of detoxification, like fundamental number one is, are you drinking enough spring water? The, the solution to pollution is dilution. So are you moving things through your system by drinking a, a nice minimum amount of spring water and getting that through your system? And then are you sweating? Are you in the sauna? Are you rebounding? Are you in the sun? You know, are you doing any of these things that are fundamental to the detoxification process? Uh, so yeah, I mean, in that case, usually I screen people out, like if they have multiple medications that have like serious side effects, I usually won't work with those types of people. Um, but in the case that that would occur, I would go to the other things instead of activated charcoal, just out of a, a precautionary principle. So you mentioned water, and I know you post a lot about Mountain Valley and spring water, which is awesome. So I'm curious in general, how, how did you get to this conclusion? Because i um, totally on the same page. Um, I think, you know, there's even research that shows, you know, the minerals we absorb from, from water are, you know, more bioavailable basically than like taking a supplement of minerals and, you know, it comes back to these whole food sources, right? And in general, we've, we've drank spring water or just water <laughs> before it was ruined uh, for, you know, probably all of, you know, humanity time span, but I know there's still all this debate going on in the health community, whether you should drink spring water, you know, or mineral water and compared to like reverse osmosis filtered, or, you know, there's this whole debate going on and, and you know, remineralizing and of course, you know, avoiding tap water at all costs. But yeah, I'm curious, you know, why do you think spring water is superior you know, what's the best way to go about sourcing that, um, different brands and things like that. And, you know, what, what are your thoughts on like filtered water in general? Mm. I think spring water is the superior form of water. And I've talked about this because it's from an evolutionary perspective, it's all we consumed. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, for example, if we're, if we're going to talk about, is there a difference between animal meat and whey protein? Obviously, I'm going to recommend more animal meat because that's what evolutionarily we, des we were designed to consume. Um, so spring water is just, I mean, it's incredible in all ways. Like we can dive into structure. We can dive into its life cycle. That's something I've covered in depth. But essentially, it's just, it's the creme de la creme of water because it has more energetic potential. And I know you've commented on a, on a few tweets in the past, uh, Tristan, specifically on Easy Water, the work of Dr. Gerald Pollack. That's, that's incredible work. Um, but I really started to get into this through, I believe, the work of Victor Schauberger. I, I found him somehow, but he was a, an obsessed Austrian forester who, who studied water all of his life. So he observed it naturally. He studied its flow. And 
when you when you dive into the his work specifically and you do the research on like implosion energy versus explosion energy you see the the power that something as simple as water carries and a lot of people take it for granted they just think oh it's just a liquid like what's so special about water well when you when you dig into its life cycle and you see how it goes through countless vortices you see how it carries energy and how it gets um charged by by infrared light and all these other things like it really is a symphony in and of itself like mother nature is the wisest possible creator and so she infused her magic into water and that's um i mean that's just a rabbit hole like i can go down forever but if you want to talk about filtered water and why i'm not a fan of that is because it just doesn't replicate spring water it doesn't have the microorganisms the microalgae doesn't have the minerals um it, and it's dead. And that's the distinction I like to make is that spring water is alive. It has energy. It responds to the environment. While, de- while dead water is just, you know, re- either reverse osmosis without remineralization or just straight up tap or filtered water. It's interesting that you mentioned like li- like it being like living water and, and using the word dead water, because that's kind of how I viewed it in the past as well. And I look at it in the, in the guise of society. We're so focused on on sanitation and killing things with antibiotics and, and putting, washing our hands and like putting, um, like antiseptic on our hands and all this stuff. And we're, we're killing all these different biomes around us that we were meant to live in synergistically. And I think it makes us, I don't even have to say, I think, I know it makes us weaker as an individual and our health suffers because of it. And I think that goes, goes similarly with water. So I just find that whole thing extremely fascinating. Yeah, I mean, when you look at spring water, for example, like it never travels in a straight line. When do you see Mother Nature funnel spring water in a straight line? You'll see, and, and this is something we've implemented into, into cities and in in municipal systems. We're always funneling water into, dead water into a straight line. But when you look at nature and how water moves, it moves in all various different ways. It goes through vortices, it spins. And that is the, that is the magic that science ca- has yet to catch up to because it can't. It's, it's reductionist Western philosophy cannot keep up with um, the more esoteric ideas or areas of study. And I think that's so important because it's just, it reminds everyone of really how little we know about everything. And I actually think it's like almost, we've made less progress in the past 50 to 75 years than before that. You're talking, you know, Victor uh, Schauberger's like, you know, early 20th century, like a lot of these guys who discovered, um, you know, some of this really cool stuff was kind of like early, mid 20th century. I'm reading Body Electric right now, Robert O. Becker, you know, DC electric current and, and bones and signaling injury current effects for regeneration. Like all this stuff was kind of like people were researching. And then it was like right when big pharma and just big centralization, you know, spurred forward even further in the late kind of 20th century, all this became so woo woo. Right. And that's, what's so wild because it's like, cra- no, seriously, if you start talking about this stuff, you're like uh, just some, you know, crazy person, but in reality, it's, it's purely rooted in, in science. And, you know, you talk about anything, you're talking about the electromagnetic, you know, potential of activated charcoal. These are, these are scientific, you know, things that we just can't grasp them. And, you know, I read something on Twitter today that was like, it's just talking about how it's just oversaturated with, you know, information about, you know, things. And it's, it's really stupid because in general, like there, we know so little. And I think that's what you appreciate when, you, you know, we talk about this stuff is, is really, you know, we're only at the tip of the iceberg, but it's also exciting to be in this field because I think the tides are turning back into this direction of like creativity and innovation in terms of understanding our innate biology and the things around us. But in general, you know, it's all very complex, um, especially if you go and, and talk and, and, and try and read about, you know, structured water and the really strange properties of water and why, for example, if you boil water, it's actually faster to boil it from cold water, not hot water, which is like, it doesn't even make sense. And we don't even, 
really comprehend the full grasp or the scope of how water functions and, you know, talk about easy water and how we make water in our body. Um, you could talk about deuterium and all yeah. that fun stuff. Right. But it's, uh, for me really exciting, but I think it's a good actionable, you know, high level takeaway is what you're saying is water is alive in the form of, you know, it's natural state of, you know, getting spring water and, you know, filtering it and probably even remineralizing it after that is, is not the same. I mean, obviously avoiding municipal water at all costs is a, a, a good idea. So um, it's, it's just fascinating. And I think as well, I might as well ask, you know, in terms of hydration, right? Like how does, how does that impact hydration? Because um, you see all the gym bros walking around. I was in the sauna with a guy yesterday with like a gallon jug yeah. of, of water and he's chugging it chugging it in the sauna and uh, for me that's a sign of you know poor hydration poor health and I thought about this a lot I actually like hiked uh, Mount Hood two three weeks ago with my buddy and I probably drank like a liter of water and you know I I didn't really have to pee on the trail at all and my friend had one of his camelbacks and and he probably downed like three four liters of water on, on the hike and I was just like man like why are you drinking all this water it's it's cold. I'm not even like really sweating too much. He's like, Oh, it's just, you know, it's good for you. It's what you're supposed to do. Hydrate. I'm like, I think people's misconception of hydration is one of the biggest like fallacies of the entire like health fitness industry. And, you know, you hear all this, just drink more, drink more, drink more. But to me, it's actually a sign of like, you're not healthy really, if you have to drink all this dead water and it's not going to do much for you anyway. And and just one thing to add on to that, because this was an interesting thing that happened to me, and I, I still kind of notice it to a lesser degree. But when I whenever I travel through like mm, through air yeah. flight through flying, I can drink almost as much water as I want on the plane, and I'll never have to pee because my body is just like it's just it's just like frantically. And this is where I I know I have areas to grow still because this happens every time I go to L.A., which is not a very long flight from Salt Lake City maybe a little over an hour, two hours, depending on which way you're going. I, for like the whole first day that I'm there after flying, it's just, I feel like a husk just from that one flight. It's so annoying, but that just speaks to hydration, how it's not just drinking water. Cause I see that too at the gym, Tristan, like I'll go into the sauna there and they're just chugging gallon plastic water bottles, like (laughs) left and right. And it's hysterical. What what a what a great way to detoxify yourself while adding more toxins <laughs> to your system, right? It's um, countering. Yeah, man. I mean, this this is the one area that drives me absolutely insane, and I have some work to do, like just mentally in terms of, if, you know, taking on people's perspective and and knowing that they don't know any of this stuff, like they haven't gone down this rabbit hole. So when I hear people bastardize water, bastardize hydration, when I hear society do that, I come from it. Uh, from the standpoint of just education. So um, again, hydration, in my opinion, is probably the most grossly underrated aspect of health. Um, like I said, we have bastardized it and we've really just mechanized it. We, we've taken the life out of it for the most part because all it is in most people's minds is just, yeah, I just need to chug more water. Uh, and it's not even taking into account like, okay, how what is the the frequency through which you drink water? What is the quality of your water? Is it mineralized? Uh, Does it have pollutants in it? Uh, How fast are you chugging that water? Because if you're chugging it, then you're just stressing your body out. So um, you're just contributing to chronic stress. So these are all factors that I think are extremely important to understand. And um, I think above all else, it's just fascinating for me. And it's, it's the one area of health that I really find myself diving deeper into and, and find myself attached to because like one thing I learned is that through the, within the, the history of, of Victor Schauberger's life, like he was approached by the Nazis and Hitler sat down with him to create a propulsion system, also known as a flying saucer, to give the Nazis an edge in, in the war. Like just knowing that is absolutely insane to me. Um, and that just goes to show the power of implosion energy, the power of his study on spring water and just um, his, his obsession to the craft. Yeah, actually, I had another thought too when we were talking about um, all of this science coming from, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. I mean, Robert O'Becker's work was quite a long time ago. And like, I feel bad because I was actually supposed to be the one that landed Tristan 
the body electric book and I just never did. So I want to apologize to the entire world right now for never doing that. It's still sitting in my drawer upstairs. It's okay. Um, I like to write in my books, so it's all good. (laughs) But it's a great book. I think everyone at some point should read it, even though it's pretty dense, uh, depending on your background. But one thing I was thinking about was another book I read called The Healing Power of the Sun, which is a pretty, it's a pretty high level book. Like when you read it and you kind of already know about circadian biology and all these like different factors about light and melanin and stuff. It's it's not super groundbreaking to you, but I think it's a great introductory book. I had my mom read it. She loved it. And um, it talks about in there, along with, we were talking about water, heliotherapy and how people were using doctors pre big pharma days were using heliotherapy, sun therapy to help people with tuberculosis and stuff like that before things like, like penicillin and all these antibiotics and all this stuff came out and how they were actually building hospitals in a way that allowed, and they actually go back to the ancient Greeks and Romans, how they, they built these medical facilities to go with the sun and allow the most natural sun to be present because it is that important and how our, it goes through the whole thing about how our modern ar- uh, architecture has gone away from optimizing sunlight, the way the, the way windows are and the way buildings are built. Um, I even compare the house I'm in now to my girlfriend's house how her house has no natural light. It's impossible. Just the way it was built does not allow for it. It's like you're in a cave and it's insane. I I always call her house Plato's cave uh, for Plato's theory of the cave because it's just insanely dark. It's crazy. But I just think it's interesting how these old philosophies are now kind of coming back into play in our community. And it's not new knowledge. I mean, uh, people like Jack Cruz talk about this all the time. Like we've actually known about this even in the literature for decades. And so it's it's almost not new, but it's sort of a rediscovery. And so I find that really fascinating. It's really, it's lost wisdom. Yeah. It's suppressed wisdom by, you know, Big Pharma. I mean, John D. Rockefeller, that, that family, they, they've done a number on society and just contributing to this, this shit show that we're currently in. But um, yeah, I mean, vitamin D3, sunlight, just absolutely massive part of my routine. Um, I, I really do. I love being tan, first of all. But the like the feeling you get when you're on a Wednesday wait, afternoon. Wait, 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 wait. Don't you know there is no safe amount of tan, Zade? <laughs> I saw a dermatologist on TikTok say there is no safe amount of tan. You need to slather on the screen. Even, even behind windows, you need to slather on the screen. Inside, you got to wear sunscreen all the time. Yeah, you see the absurdity of the situation. Like, still, most of the people in my life think that sunscreen is a great option. And, and meanwhile, I'm over here thriving health-wise. I have more energy than all of them combined. I, I sleep like a baby, and I get probably an hour and a half of sun like four to five times a week. Or at least I, I aim to do that. Like, proper sunbathing. And I think this is also the biggest difference in, in – this is the biggest differentiation I can make here. There is a massive difference between going out under the sunlight, fully clothed, and like actually sunbathing. That, that is a massive difference because that's what's going to allow your body to make the vitamin D3 conversion in the first place. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just there's, there's a lot of misinformation on this stuff, but vitamin D3 is absolutely crucial for health. So in general, you know, you talk, you talk a lot about kind of how imperative these things are. You know, you have clients and stuff. I know your whole uh, approach is like 80-20, and maybe I want to get into that a little bit um, because I know I have my thoughts. But in general, it's like I think what you're saying is, you know, you're trying to give people like actionable ways to live their life. So I guess, you know, someone who's living, you know, in L.A., which is, you know, a very big city where you could easily get trapped in, you know, the just hustle and bustle of whatever you're doing to make it. And, you know, it's high EMF. It's just a lot of people are in offices, probably under artificial light. Like what are some actionable, easy steps people can do? Or like, how do you see is just easy ways for, for people to get better. And, and is that how you kind of incorporate it into that 80, 20 approach? Yeah, you know, a lot of my work, the foundational part of my work is just making sure that I maximize results in minimal time using timeless principles. Because I I think if you approach the work any other way that's not focused on timeless principles, what are you doing? It's just like you're, um, for me, it's, I mean, I don't know where I stand on, on chiropractors, but for me, if you go into a chiropractor and they just adjust you 
and you continue to have the same type of lifestyle and movement patterns, then you're just a lifelong customer. I don't want people to be a lifelong customer for me. I want them to work with me for eight weeks, one time, and I want them to reap the benefits of that work for the rest of their life until they die. Um, so that's that's really what that's really what drives a lot of my coaching. And again, 80-20, I think that's just a popular idea that I really uh, enjoyed. I think it, the idea that you can focus on one or two things that produce 80 plus percent of the results, that's very attractive to me. And I think it's very attractive to people in general because we don't all have time to be obsessive freaks about health like my, like me or, or you guys or anything. You know, we, we don't have time for that. Or most people don't have time for that. So they, they really just want to maximize the amount of results that they get in as little time. And, and I really value that value. Yeah. Value that because again, life is short. People have family, people have hobbies, um, things of that nature. Yeah. And I think the, I think when I hear 80, 20, it, I think actually it means different things to different people, sort of like how different even dietary philosophies like carnivore means something different than uh, someone else says carnivore, because I know many people that do 80, 20, and it's really more like 60, 40 or 50, 50 really. Um, and, and they're, they're also, also though, it's like sort of putting the cart before the horse with all the diet stuff anyways. Now that I've come to that realization, it, it's, it's definitely a pillar, but I feel like it, if you focus on just the one pillar, you're, you're missing the point. And so I, I do think, I do think it depends personally on the situation. I know for myself, and I'm sort of a believer in, to an extent, this idea of moderators versus abstainers. I have to be an abstainer because when I try to moderate, I just get hooked. And it's just my personality type where I go zero to 100 in anything. Same. Um, and so for me, it would be really hard to do like 80 20 with food, anyways. Um, there are certain other things that I'm sure I could, but I think, I think there's just like this misnomer that there's a definition for everything. And I think it's really multiple definitions depending on the individual. And that's something that you have to work out with, with a coach. Like that's the whole point of your, your gig, right. Is to help them figure that out for themselves. Because at the end of the day, like you said, you want them to be able to do it by themselves and not have to hold your hand for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up that point. Actually, it's a great one. Um, the differentiation between 80, 20 in the context of like bodybuilder nutrition or just typical nutrition, like that's, that's completely different from the 80, 20 I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting in sleep, hydration, nutrition, movement and training, supplementation, detoxification, blood work. There are, there are a few timeless principles that you can focus on. And once you know those things, you're, you're good to go for the most part with health. But in context of like the 80-20 that a lot of people think about with nutrition, it's like, okay, 80%, I can eat broccoli and chicken breast. I can have some pasteurized milk. And then, you know, the other 20%, I just have an entire pizza by myself at Friday on Friday at 9 o'clock p.m. So that's the key differentiation for me. And I think I need to do a little bit, uh, I need to do a better job of marketing that because that's a, it's a really important point. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that, to be honest, because I was, it didn't really make sense to me. I was like, this guy is like so knowledgeable. And yeah, I, I think it's just because we're so used to seeing it from like the fitness bros. It's like, you know, and and just to harp on again, why I don't just dis- why I don't agree with what they're saying is because, yeah, it's just like you then you're just looking forward to your cheat meal or your whatever. And you're just so much justifying your vices. And then it does become, yeah, like Ryan said, 60, 40, but what you're saying totally makes sense. And I totally agree because it's like this whole health space is so overwhelming with information and different hacks and things that you can do when it's like, if you just focus on like a few fundamental changes in your lifestyle, you'll get 80% of the results. And then from there, that 20% is like fine tuning um, as you kind of go along. And that for sure, I 100% resonate with, because at the end of the day, all this stuff is really complex. You know, we're talking about, you know, like circadian biology and water down to like the quantum level. And at the end of the day, no one's going to understand that. But in reality, drink spring water, eat high quality food, go outside, move, connect with nature, be social, love. And there you go. You're killing it. 99.9% of people don't do that. 
and, and there are a few things that people say, well, like, oh, you don't enjoy yourself with this type of lifestyle. On the oh. contrary, I do. I, I feel great and I enjoy, you know, my experience of life. How about your movement, you know, routine? Like, what what are you doing? You know, your former soccer player as well, I guess. Yeah. What? How do you value, like, strength training versus cardio versus hit? That was really popular for a while or just, yeah, in general, kind of what do you see in, in that space? Yeah. Uh, I like to take a balanced approach to just um, movement and training. So, and also I like to differentiate between movement and training. In my mind, those are two very different things. So general movement is like, okay, how many steps are you getting in? Brisk walks, uh, mobility, things of that nature, which which really count um, for a large portion of longevity. And then on the training aspect, I've, I've focused a lot of my life, to be honest, on competitive soccer. So I'm really good with the agility aspect, the sprint stuff, um, just being dynamic in my in my movement. But one area that I've lacked and that's really held me back from joining the gym because I'm so focused on soccer is, is just building that strength and building that muscle um, to, to then enhance performance and get all these other benefits. So over the past like four or five months, I've really been focused on the gym, compound movements, um, a lot of knees over toes guys stuff. Uh, and just generally like building those compound movements up. So like heavy squats, um, you know, deadlifts, of course, going progressively, like progressive ro- overload. But again, like holistic, holistic framework with that and just making sure that I improve up- upon what I currently have. Yeah. I mean, all those tips are really great. I think people take movement to an extreme, meaning me, and uh, definitely has not done me well in the past. Uh, so one final question I sort of like to, we would sort of like to ask everybody is we're all about decentralization, or at least I'm trying. I'm trying, people. Okay. We'll fix this. We'll fix this in the future. He's doing but, the work. Um, <laughs> I'm doing the work. I'm trying. Got to pay the bills first. Um, but what is one step you think people can take right now to move in a more decentralized fashion for themselves? Whether that be something around food, something around movement, uh, financial. What do you think is like, a first step for people that is actionable that pretty much anyone can do right now. Listen to this podcast. <laughs> Listen to this podcast. First of all, <laughs> probably arm yourself with not probably most definitely arm yourself with the necessary education with the right information. And if you have to dig through research papers, if you have to go down the internet rabbit hole for hours on end, that is the cost of knowing that you have the right information at hand and that it works. So if you're not educated, if you don't have any, you don't take a holistic approach to this, this work, you're never going to be decentralized. You're always going to rely on big pharma for your, for your news, CNN, mainstream media, um, you know, any, any popular bodybuilder bro influencer out there. So you have to take education into your own hands. And that requires a level of commitment, a level of discipline and a level of curiosity. Heck Yeah. I think that's, yeah, it's beautiful. It's, it's so true. Like education just empowers you at the individual level to the utmost degree. And we've become so lazy in that regard. And that's why people are always looking for, you know, simple suggestions or just people to tell them what to do. So at the end of the day, yeah, if you want to become truly more decentralized and more empowered, you need to take the responsibility of, of learning how to get there. So Zaid, Thanks so much for coming on, man. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, where can everyone find you? Let's uh, help them make that easy. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. It's, it's been a fun time. Um, Twitter at Zaid K. Dahaj. I'm sure you guys will have links in the description. So mm-hmm. Instagram, same tag. Uh, you can also find me at the 2AM podcast on all platforms. Um, that's a lot of fun. You know, covering dedicated episode topics like spring water, raw milk, stuff like that. And um, yeah, it's pretty much where you can find me. Awesome. Yeah, definitely check out 2AM Podcast. I've seen some clips there and seems like just really, uh, you know, a relatable pod that you guys are doing, kind of just less structured, but also really high quality information. So love to see that kind of a bit unique in that regard. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Zaid, for coming on. And thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of Decentralized Radio. See you next time. Thank you, guys.